Hello. How you doing? Hello. So welcome. I am Howard Scott Warshaw. I'm going to chat with you for a while. Some of you know me, some of you may not. How many of you have seen Atari Game Over? Just wanted to check. How many of you have seen the angry video game nerd movie? Okay. How many, how many of you have seen Dr. Strangelove? Oh, yeah. One of the all-time movies. Okay, so I was a game programmer at Atari. As many of you know, I did Yours Revenge, I did Raiders of the Lost Ark, I did E.T., and I also did Saboteur, which is the lesser-known game, which was because it was released about 20 years after I left Atari. <laughs> but still got released, so I'm very pleased by that. So, and nowadays, I am actually a psychotherapist. You know, a lot of people yeah, that's think funny. that's a weird transition, going from being a programmer to being a therapist. I never really saw it as that odd a transition, to tell you the truth. To me, it was very natural, because the way I see it is programmers and therapists we're all systems analysts, right? It's just I moved on to a much more sophisticated hardware. That's the way I look at it. But having gone there, it's given me a lot, of, I've done a lot of thought and uh, introspection on programming and gaming and things like that. And I've come across, I think, some interesting points that I just wanted to share with you because sharing interesting ideas, that's what I really like to do. Uh, if you have questions, do any of you have questions? And uh, if you do, good, because I will get to that soon, because the sooner we get to a question and answer thing, I'm very happy with that. But if there's no questions, I can talk. That's not a problem. <laughs> so, and one thing I do want to say, if one of your questions is, will you autograph stuff for us? The answer is yes. Yes, I will. <laughs> and I will do that at a booth. There's going to be a booth to the left of the registration. There's going to be a table to the left, so as you go out here and then you see the registration, we go left instead of right, and I'll be right there, and I will be happy to sign your stuff, and I will also be selling copies of my DVD, Once Upon a Tar. We have to do the shilling part first. <laughs> so, in a point of fact, let's see, I probably have one right here. How many of you have heard of Once Upon a Tar? Wow, how many of you already have a copy of Once Upon a Tar? Here it is. How many of you have an autographed copy of Once Upon a Time? <laughs> wow! Wow! Great crowd! Great crowd. Okay, so I want to talk just for a few minutes about psychology and programming and games, because I think there's some interesting life lessons we get from that. And the first thing I want to talk about, how many of you are programmers or have done some programming? Understand what programming is about. Okay, so if you've ever done some programming, you know a few things about programs. And one of the first the most important thing to understand to me about computer programming is that most people think it's an exercise in math or science or technology, and it really isn't. It's an exercise in communication. If you think about it, that's why they call it programming languages. And the truth is, when IBM first started the actual uh, career position of programmer, computer programmer, uh, there was no such thing as computer programmer curricula in universities and stuff. So they were looking for people, and they weren't looking for mathematicians, they were looking for language majors. Those were the first computer programmers. And it makes sense, because if you think of programming as a language, and if you think about the level, the quality of programming you can do as a degree of your eloquence in that language, and the way I've always looked at programming is that a computer is sort of like a, a foreign nation. And what you do is you have to send an ambassador to that nation to negotiate a trade deal to get what you want from that nation. And so a programmer is an ambassador you send to the computer, and the more eloquent a programmer you send, the better a deal you're going to negotiate with that foreign land. So I thought that was a very good metaphor for looking at programming. And because programming is so much about communication, we learn things about how we communicate, how we talk to each other. And the first thing you learn when you're programming a computer which is an incredibly valuable lesson in communication in general because this is the source of many problems in relationships. And that is, it's the difference between what I meant and what I said. <laughs> right? Now, everybody who's programmed a computer knows exactly what it is like, 
Oh, okay. I can see why the computer, for some reason, thought it should do that just because I told it to. But what I meant it to do, and it's like that. With the computer, it's great because the computer has no judgment. It has no value placed on you. It just does what you ask it to. Reminds me of a friend of mine who would scream. He's a programmer. He'll scream at his computer. Don't do what I say. Do what I mean. I've never heard of a programmer scream at his computer, but I will accept your story. <laughs> He's kind of nuts. So. That's, I think that's a very important quality in a good programmer. You have to be a little nuts. Not too nuts. Although we're not going to go there. So. so, and I think it's a very important thing to realize in general is, you know, when we deal with the difference between what we mean and what we say, when we're dealing with people, you know, they're not nice enough just to give us a brief error message and allow us to correct our, our syntax, right? <laughs> what they do is they get upset or they have arguments or they don't let us know they're upset and they hold it back and then we find out later they were really upset. That's what happens with people and you say, I don't know what you're upset about because I told you blah, blah, blah. And then they'll say, well, no, what you said was, well, I meant and you should know that. And that's what happens just before you wind up in my office. <laughs> so, but I've always found computers are an excellent background for being a therapist because there's that whole communication element to it. The other thing computers can teach us about is the difference between nuance or a lack thereof because computers have no nuance. There's absolutely no nuance. When you say something to a computer, it either doesn't know what you mean and it says, you know, sorry, can't decode it. Or it does exactly what you told it. There is no nuance. There's no shade of meaning. Well, not the case with people. And that's what happens when programmers get into relationships, which is another thing I see a lot <laughs> in my office. Because one of the things I specialize in is working, of course, with programmers. I work with high-tech leaders, high-tech programmers, and the super intelligent. I like working with really, really smart people. Because you don't have to be as smart as someone to help them, right? You just have to be smart enough. And you can usually be smart enough if you need to. So nuance is, is another funny area. People talk about fuzzy logic. People have been trying to help computers learn nuance for a long time. And that's always kind of a funny exercise. Because the computers don't really seem to get it. Computers have an algorithm for nu nuance which was made by someone who understood nu nuance and realized at some level you can't program nuance. So computers are absolute. They're right or wrong, definitive, unambiguous. How many of you wish communicating with people was just like that? <laughs> really almost no, oh, tell the truth. <laughs> if you're a programmer, how many times have you said, oh my god, I wish it was this easy at all? You know, it's, that happens, but what I like to do is I specialize in couples that are like one person is in tech, is a heavy programmer, and the other person is someone who loves someone who's in tech. So what I tell them is I specialize in translating between English and nerd, and, uh, and that becomes an important thing. Now, games teach us some other lessons. Above the lessons that computers teach us, games teach us a number of interesting lessons. One of the first ones, and it was always one of my favorites, is that greed kills. That's where you learn greed kills. When you're playing a game and you're really into it, particularly a Twitch action game, you're cruising, you're doing really well, you could be in the zone, you're not even paying attention to your playing because you're, you're just doing so well. And as soon as you become aware of what you're doing, that's when you blow it and you fall out of the game, right? Because you were in the zone, you were, you know, you have, because you can learn a lot about mindfulness and meditation from games also. So that's fun. But, the first thing is greed kills. How many times is it when you're going for the extra couple of points just to make the perfect score or something, and that's when you die? You were doing so good, but I just needed a little bit more. Greed kills. Great lesson from computers. Another one is balance. You know, balance is an issue that a lot of us face in our lives and all kinds of things, and, and computer games teach us a lot about balance. One thing they teach is the balance between luck and skill. We are just talking about this at breakfast today. Balance between luck and skill is a very important balance in gaming because it's really hard to master in life, right? Because if you're doing well in life, you say, well, it's skill. And if it's not working very well, you say, ah, oh, I have bad luck. But everything is a mixture of luck and skill. And uh, games have a really interesting balance to that. Like chess is a game that's like all skill and no luck. And then you have uh, 
Again, one of my personal favorites, like uh, craps, which has very little skill involved, although people might claim otherwise, <laughs> right? And then you have a game like backgammon, which is an excellent <coughs> mixture of luck and skill. Another balance that you find in video games is the balance between if I get behind, can I come back? How easy is it to come back from being behind? The more luck there is in a game, the more opportunity there is for that. But if it's the game's all luck, it's not very satisfying. So backgammon, again, I think it's a great game. It's a well-balanced game because you can get very far behind and you can still come way back. And that's amazing. So whether you like games that are more luck-oriented or more uh, deterministic, less luck-oriented, sometimes depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. You know the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? See, that an optimist is someone who believes this is the best of all possible worlds. And a pessimist is afraid that's true. <laughs> right. that's, that's the difference between an optimist. So another thing is risk and reward. Risk and reward is another thing that we learn about in games. I think it's an interesting lesson for us all. Is that, you know, you're trying to achieve rewards. Usually most games have to have some kind of positive feedback mechanism because you don't get anything out of it. There's not much reason to play it. But, you know, most of us learn there are some things we can go in the game that are easy to get, some things that are tougher. Is it worth going for it? How many lives is that going to cost me? We actually make a lot of economic decisions when we're playing a video game that we don't even realize. So it's kind of an interesting model for life. So the one last thing I want to talk about that I think is a very interesting thing we get out of games is inspiration. Okay, because games can be inspiring. And I think inspiration is a very important thing that we deal with in life. Someone was inspired by that. <laughs> because, you know, we live in a world where miracles do happen. And that's an important thing to remember, in my opinion. Because we see plenty of counterexamples. And games teach us that occasionally amazing things happen, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we even understand how it happened or not. Sometimes you do something. How many of you remember the experience of doing something in a video game you thought was absolutely impossible to do, but you pulled it off? How gratifying was that? Did that feel good? Did you tell anybody about that? I did this. And that brings up a thing my friend Rob's the devil over there. It was a point he used to always talk about this thing about metagaming. And that's, you know, you can play the game, but the metagame, the thing that happens around the game is like talking about the game, engaging about the game, playing the game in ways other than the way the game was intended to be played. And this idea that when you achieve something in a game, you want to tell somebody about it, you want recognition, a leaderboard is the most obvious example of that, that's announcing it. But when you do something so cool, you want to tell someone about it, that happens in games. And I, I put that in the category of inspiration. So there are aspects of playing games that inspire us to take us to a place that was more fun than where we were a little while ago. And that's always a good place to go as far as I'm concerned. So I just wanted to put those thoughts out there. Are, are those interesting thoughts? Yeah. Yes. I just want to check. Because yeah. if I ever say them again, I want to know if I'm entertaining people or boring. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions? If you guys want to get to a Q&A thing, that's okay. And if you want to ask me stuff about ET, it's okay. I'm not really that sensitive. <laughs> Totally okay with it. Um, so, uh, do you still play games? And if so, what games do you play now? <laughs> That's my wife laughing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I do play games. I am not yet a recovering Candy Crush Saga player. <laughs> I am still in the throes of Candy Crush, and it's brutal, but uh, it's a fun game. And I enjoy that. I, I tend to like the one screeners. I like the evolution of gaming. Gaming has come around full circle, right? In the beginning, it was the one screen action. And then it got bigger. And then it got bigger. And it used to have one person, one game, there it was. That was, that was us at Atari in the beginning. And that was a beautiful, beautiful world, right? Because then making a game was a work of authorship. You know, you were an auteur. And you did everything in the game. And whether you did it well or not, you did it. it. was your game. You were bought into it. And you made it happen. It was cool. And that grew and grew. And console gaming grew until it got to the point where now you have teams of like hundreds of people, literally. Uh, and all kinds of coordinating. A lot of work to do. And it can still be cool, but it is not one person, one vision moving forward. And it's not as flexible. You know, it's the difference between having a nice little sleek motorboat or driving the Titanic. And I don't mean that metaphorically. <laughs> Entirely. <laughs> the 
because I have worked on some Titanics, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, but what happened is with the advent of handheld devices and things like this, you know, console gaming got to a point where you need to commit your life, you know, to the game. And it's great because you can get 60, 70, 80 hours or more of entertainment out of a game, out of a good game. That's huge. That's an and it's an amazing value for your entertainment dollar. But I'm not always ready to commit days to a game. Sometimes I only have five minutes to throw away. And it's very important to me to waste that time <laughs> as effectively as possible. <laughs> and so the single screen gamer and that kind of thing still lives. And that's revived. So now you can have games that one person or a small team of people can do again. And that's why it's come full circle. Right? Is that a thing that started originally with people who can just do a game. One person has a concept they can do a game. And there was a beauty to that. That some people in this room really got to enjoy. And that was fabulous. And that totally went away and now it's come back. And it's come back in some cases with a vengeance. And it's cool. It's cool because more people are able to really experience what that's like. To realize your vision or to try and realize your vision and realize how hard it is to realize that vision. You know, and for me, I feel like I've come full circle in the same kind of loop in a sense. You know, because becoming, becoming a therapist ever having been a, a game maker, I used to look at it as, you know, I entertain nerds. That's what I do. And now I actually make their lives better. <laughs> and so that has been an interesting evolution. But, you know, a lot of things come full circle. That's kind of an abstract answer. What is this, a debate? <laughs> Yes, you had your hand up before. Yes, uh, and you're next. Do I have an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my opinion on VR gaming is uh, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> now, VR is a very important uh, development, in my opinion, and I think that the Im immersive gaming is a huge thing, right? Because you know, people play with different kinds of controllers, different kinds, there's a lot of ways you try and engage someone in a game. And to be truly immersive, to get into a multi-sensory experience and have someone truly believe it. How many of you have ever played a game, like, to me, the first VR game, the game that will stand as the bridge between pre-VR gaming and post-VR gaming, to me, is GTA 3. Okay? I think it's a very important game in the evolution of gaming. I think that game has reprehensible theming, <laughs> which I'm not really a big fan of, but it's an amazingly well-designed game and it plays really well. And that game is significant because it showed, it really showed the difference between design and technical innovation in games. And what VR is going to enhance that difference, okay? Because game, game progress over the years, this is a little bit of digression, but that's okay, because I have the mic. So, <laughs> You know, I think if you look at the evolution of gaming, games get better and better and better, and then they get more narrow cast, and there's few kinds of games. And because people need predictability, people who make games, the companies that make games need predictability, which means you're going to see less new kind of stuff, and the way you're going to provide innovation is technological. Because I can promise you that I can find people who will make the graphics accelerator work a little bit better next year. And we can get more polys on the screen, I can get more colors, and I can get better artists, and I can make the game look better. And I can make the physics more realistic. These are things I can reliably do. Do they make a game better, though? You know, they make the experience a little more entertaining in some ways, a little more engaging. But what's the new idea? What's the thing that changes the way I play a game that shows me something I haven't seen before? Last night, I got to play a game with some, you know, my friends from Atari. There are people in this room who were my friends from Atari, fabulous people. And to this day, you know, my friend brings out a new game. And here's a game, and we played it, and it was fun. And the, what was fun about it was we could sit around a bunch of games, and I look at it and go, this is a really interesting design concept. This is an interesting aspect of the game. You, you can make a game better with design, okay? But you can't plan to make a game better with design, and that's the thing. You can plan to make your technology better, but you can't plan to make your design better. You need design innovation. You need someone with a spark, with an idea. And that is a much harder thing to plan on. And the reason you know that for sure is how many new versions of a game do you see versus how many new games 
you see. Part of the reason you don't see new games is because of the risk of the investment. But with you know, handheld games and, and the lower threshold for investment in the game, you do see a lot more new games now. I mean, I've heard that there's like 100 games a day that are produced now if you look at all the free apps and all the games. You know, how many of you have the opportunity to play a new game virtually every day? No, most of yeah. the games on the phone. Right. And I point out that most of the games on the phones are either clones of existing games or just mainly or monetization. Right, but the way I put it is most of the games that come out now kind of suck. Right? <laughs> I mean, there's a huge amount of great new indie material. This is the greatest era for gaming. Since we were putting the shit out in plastic bags with cassette tapes, kids. Those guys out there, they are losing their shirts. All right? But they're making games they believe in, and they're making some great games. And yeah, there's Flappy Bird. At least it was an original idea. Piece of shit. <laughs> and all the people doing rip off should be ashamed of themselves. But there's a lot, a lot, a lot of good material. Everything is not King Games and Candy Crush. Uh, I have come to me, I'll recommend a dozen wonderful, wonderful new iPad games that won't even send you back for more than 10 bucks. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob's the devil. <laughs> So, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, but it also, the signal to noise ratio has gotten distorted in the game market because there's a lot of crap, because there are more games, it's easier to make games, there's a lot more crappy games. But you do see more regularly genuine innovations, solid new additions to gaming, but they're few and far between because having a real spark, having a real inspiration for something that's fresh and something that's compelling, it doesn't happen that often. That's harder to do than technological innovation. But I think VR is something, just to get back to the question very briefly. <laughs> as well, you know, might as well be at the question for a moment. You know, VR, I think, is a huge opportunity to move forward. But VR is much bigger than gaming. VR is a human experience. Uh, it's a new way of encapsulating experience and recording things and documenting things for, for people in general. Gaming is going to be one avenue of that. But I think VR is a huge uh, point of innovation in human society, not just gaming. If that answers your question. But I promised the gentleman back there in the white hat he was next. Um, so you've made a lot of games. Has there ever been a game you've made and then you went to play it afterward and you would have had trouble playing it because you didn't know what the game was? Like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. No. <laughs> uh, tell you the truth, I don't think I could sit down and beat Raiders of the Lost Ark right now. I don't think I could find everything in it. I don't think I could remember it. It was tough. Raiders, I wanted Raiders to be like the biggest adventure game on the machine at the time. And it's usually in competition with one other adventure game you know, for what's the largest game. And I have my own thoughts about that. But Raiders has, has a much different sense of screen to screen what it is. I wanted to do something that was big that way, that was reflexive in the movie. And, I wanted, and it was a big battle I had with marketing over they wanted to put all the secrets in the manual. Remember, this was pre-internet. So you couldn't just go online to Google up some cheats or what's the next step and stuff. And I was saying, no, no, I want this to be a challenge. I want this to be tough. And it was, this was one of these cases where I think marketing was absolutely right. You know, and they won and they got to put a lot of stuff in because the game would have been unplayable without it. You know, when I watch people try to work through the game and stuff, it's insane. It's insane. So I, that's a game I would have a lot of trouble doing. Yours Revenge, I can kill any time. And E.T., I know how to set it so it's easy. <laughs> question more about asking you to speak to something that is your former career and your current one and also the nature of this context and that's the notion of nostalgia and uh, the role in psychology and what it plays in in terms of gaming and uh, you know how that all comes together I'd love to get your take on that. That's a really interesting question. Uh, nostalgia is a very important phenomenon and you know as Rob would have it you know knocking stuff off is another way to refer to nostalgia, because nostalgia comes back. You know, people try to redo things, but they rarely redo them at the level of quality the original was. Nostalgia, psychologically, has some real value, okay? Because one of the most important human values is familiarity. Okay, there's like six basic human needs. Interestingly, one of them is consistency, and the, another one is inconsistency. They're both fundamental needs that we have. But there's a lot of research and testing that shows time and time again that people will pick what's familiar over what's fun in a lot of cases.
people would rather not take a risk and possibly enjoy themselves more when they know something is a familiar experience. Like when you talk about abusive relationships, and so you think, what the hell is someone doing in an abusive relationship, right? What's going on is they probably had an abusive childhood. And it became familiar with them because normal, you know, what's normal? When you talk nostalgia and normal, it's an interesting transition, but you know, normal, people ask me as therapists all the time, what's normal? What is normal? What is that? You know, I tell them, well, normal people are people you just don't know very well, right? <laughs> That's the good definition for normal. But the real definition for normal is what you're used to. The idea that there's some objective normal that we measure ourselves against, I just think that's ridiculous. That's absurd. Everybody sets their own normal. Normal is what you are used to, and that's what you will seek. And if you are used to a horrific, high drama environment, that's what you will seek. If you are used to a very quiet, calm, evenly metered exchange with people, that's what you'll seek. That's why we repeat our patterns. That's why nostalgia is great because the future is something that's very hard to control. Okay, the future comes at us and it turns into the present viciously at times. And that's always going on and we have no control over that. And so we get to this thing of like, ah, oh, the good old days. I wish it could be back at the time where everything seemed much better and much more mellow and much more in control for me. The truth is we were just as freaked out about what was coming up back then as we are now. Okay, but now that we've been through it and we know what it was involved and what our actual exposure was and how we know, the most important thing we know about the past is that we've succeeded to get past it, right? You know, we made it to now. That's the biggest success everybody has every second. <laughs> hey, I made it. You know, you want to hear, I'm going to show you an example of time travel. I'm back. <laughs> okay, so it's like nostalgia gives us the illusion that there was a time things were better, but it's really, I think it's the illusion of perspective on the past, knowing that I negotiated that and it's okay. And I'd rather be in a place where I'm sure I'm gonna be okay than be in a place where I may not be. And the future is a place we always run the risk of not being okay. We also run the risk of being sensational, okay? But we tend to worry more. And I don't know why that is. I spent a lot of time talking to people about anxiety about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was attending another the panel, so I apologize if you've covered this already, but I know a lot of the Atari designers went over to Activision, they wanted more credit for their work. Those they bastards! Better, <laughs> better uh, uh, financial compensation. What were your thoughts on working for Atari? Did you think you were treated fairly, and, did, and as you progressed working there and um, doing more different games, did you, did you think it improved, your situation improved? Are there any children in the audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard them crying. <laughs> that one was too young. Okay, then I won't describe it in exactly those terms. Atari was an amazing place. I mean, I've said that in a lot of places, but I mean, it was unbelievably cool. I got to Atari, so just last I'm talking to people, who I was there later than a lot of the other key core designers originally. And when I first got to Atari, I was like pinching myself. I could not believe it. This was like the most amazing place for us to work. And I came there from Hewlett Packard, which was supposed to be a pretty good place to work, but I was bored out of my mind at Hewlett Packard. It's like, that's like the software pasture where programmers go to die. <laughs> and, and I was so excited to get to Atari. And then when I got there, it wasn't, the reason I went to Atari wasn't to do games. I went to Atari because they were doing real-time microprocessor control programming, which is something I had done in college and I loved. The games was just a bonus. Turns out it was very cool to do games, but that wasn't why I was trying to go there. When I got there though, I was doing that and it was a totally free environment and they said, they didn't over stress you or whatever, or tell you what to do, they just said, hey, here's a manual, go program and if it's not working in a while, you know, you're fired. And, but that was okay, that was exactly what I was looking for because I was ready to go. And, so I got there and I'm thinking, this is the most amazing place I've ever been and all around me there's people going, man, this sucks, this used to be so much better. And I'm thinking, I can't imagine you know, what that was. It was astounding. So it was an incredible place to be. And so some people left, they complained about money and you know, they had a point. They had a point and you had a management structure there that had a real problem because this was a new thing. You understand that the idea of entertainment technology in this place, particularly in Silicon Valley, was a new thing, and nobody knew what to do with it. And when it, you know, Nolan kind of had an idea of what to do with it, okay? When a company like Warner 
goes and we know how to run the entertainment business and we know how to manage stuff and blah, blah, blah. So they run out and find somebody who was a CEO at a textile manufacturer to come in and run Atari. There's a culture clash there, right? Because someone who's a traditional manager is brought in to manage the absolute antithesis of a traditional situation, okay? So that's not going to work, and it didn't. But it still created incredible success. It created an incredible success because, you know, the 2600 proves a base, there is a basic fundamental comparison between the game industry and Hollywood and all of entertainment. And William Goldman, who was a, favorite, a famous uh, screenwriter, wrote this book about screenwriting. He said, there's the first law of Hollywood. The first law of Hollywood is no one knows anything, <laughs> right? And it's so true, right? Otherwise, no studio would ever release a bomb, right? They would always put out winners. So nobody <coughs> really knows. You can't predict an entertainment product. So you brought someone who's all about doing predictive marketing and stuff, and they just want an engineering department that will put out stuff that's always going to work, and they know nothing about the product, absolutely nothing. And then it takes off. So even Nolan Bushnell did not really know what he had, okay? Because Nolan Bushnell is, is not a horrible businessman, I don't think, by any stretch of the imagination. But if he would have known that Atari was going to be worth, you know, north of $500 million, in just a couple more years, I don't think he'd have sold it for 22 million at the time he did. Okay, so he didn't really know. He didn't see completely what was coming. And Warner <coughs> didn't totally get where they were going. They just wanted to get into technology. That was cool. And then when the company took off because they had stuck Ray Kazar in as like the chief executive, he kind of got the credit as far as Warner was concerned. And what's he going to do? He's going to go, go, thank you very much for this million dollar bonus. But the truth is, I have no idea what I'm doing. So he didn't do that. So what happened was Atari becomes the fastest growing company in American history. I was there for that rise, okay? And there were people who got embittered over the fact that all this money's being made and we're not seeing it. And they had a point. And so they left and they formed a company. That was Activision. And so then, Atari didn't do anything. And so then, they went a little while and then another company formed, Imagine. And I was like this close, as I understand it, to going with Imagine, but I didn't quite, I wasn't there long enough. And they went for him, so then Atari turned around and said, oh my God, we gotta do something because we're losing all our programmers and the, the gooses, the geese that lay the golden eggs are disappearing. Geese, gooses? <laughs> no, honkers. So, it became a very interesting situation. And then they came up with a ridiculous, stupid bonus plan, but at least we got the promise of getting more money. And this seemed like this was going to be exciting and this was cool. And then there was another potential startup. And Todd Fry, the guy who did Pac-Man and stuff like that, the gentleman in the salmon shirt back there. And salmon is very popular in the Pacific Northwest, as I understand it. <laughs> and he's speaking at 7 o'clock tonight. Todd and I would look to form another startup. And that was going to be called Origin Software. <coughs> And, and I was saying, look, we got to get out of here because the only way we're going to make any money is to go and start a company. And I said to Todd, don't tell anybody, don't say anything, because Todd, you know, Todd talks sometimes. <laughs> and so, and what Todd did, the first thing he did after he goes, okay, yeah, we're not going to talk anybody, he went right to, you know, our, our boss and said, you know, you know, I hate to quote him, but I'm, I've heard this quote many times. He said, you know, George, was George Kiss was the guy who was the manager of the software, he goes, you know, I really like working here, but it's beginning to cost me money. And he told them that we were going to be leaving, that us and like some of the remaining programmers were going to be leaving to go. Within 48 hours, there was a meeting called where the CEO of Atari sat there and walked around the room and handed out $40,000 checks. That was the beginning of the new bonus plan. And once that bonus plan was implemented, I was not really concerned about, you know, us not getting money and stuff like that at Atari. So that was good too. So I was doing like the most amazing job there was to do. Because, you know, and it's really true. I've heard it said, you know, it's not often that you're in your mid-20s and you're making an incredible amount of money and you're given total creative freedom to do whatever you want. And there was a window of like three weeks where we actually had that experience. <laughs> and that was pretty cool. But it was an amazing place to be. And that was good. So there were some people who were embittered by the money at first. And me at first, I was just swimming in the idea of, holy cow, don't anybody say anything because this is just amazing what's going on. And then it got better. 
Yeah, you know, and then it collapsed. It blew up. It was definitely a bomb. Does that answer your question? Yes. So that three weeks, was that right before the crash then? No, no, it was at least another you know, four weeks before the crash. <laughs> no, we had, a, we had a good window in there where things were going pretty well and that was it. You know, the late 82 looked really good because we weren't seeing the numbers. Atari, the executives started to get worried as it came out in the late 82. And they did everything they could to thank the people who went to Imagic, you know, by uh, undercutting them with their numbers and stuff. Atari was a brutal business place. Atari was the fastest growing company in American history, right? And then it became the fastest falling company in American history. Nobody's had that kind of a blip. I mean, some people have gone up faster and higher, but they didn't come down that quick. <laughs> and the reason was that the business practices that they were using while they were on the way up, is they had a real knack for stepping on people going up the ladder. And uh, so everybody, as soon as they had a chance to do something back, jumped on them with both feet. And that's why they became the fastest falling company. Because people could not wait to get Atari back for some of the behind the scenes business practices. You know, rarely has something that's brought so much joy to so many people been so reprehensible behind the scenes. <laughs> Except for a lot of other entertainment business deals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Outside of the games you program for Atari, what are some of your favorite Atari games? Uh, I have to say that Missile Command for the 2600 is very cool. I enjoyed uh, Tempest quite a bit. And, uh, and I, Dave Toyer, the guy who did Missile Command and Tempest and Coin Op, uh, he's one of my favorite people of all time, and I'll tell you why. The funny thing happened is that when I was doing Yars Revenge, he came by and he took a look at the game and he said, oh, I think we should do a coin op of this game. And I thought, oh my god, this would be the first time that somebody had ever done a coin op game from VCS game. Right, VCS, we knocked off coin op games all the time, and they were exactly like the coin op games. <laughs> but, uh, but the idea that they might do a coin op game from a VCS game was like super excited. And I was really excited, and you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in there's two kinds of people. You know, there's two kinds of people in the world. People who split the world into two kinds of people and people who don't. <laughs> you know, like that. But there's two kinds of people. There's people who get excited in anticipation of something and people who say, you know, don't get too excited because you might get disappointed. <laughs> you know? And my philosophy is if, if you have an opportunity to get excited, get excited. Get excited now because you're going to have a long time to be disappointed if you want to. Why are you going to get a head start on disappointment? <laughs> right? That never made sense to me. You know, you can put anxiety in the bank account, that's what they call it. Like people put anxiety in the bank account, you get worried, anticipatory anxiety. You're worried about what's going to happen before it happens. You're not going to have enough time to worry, you know, when it happens. You know, planning for something is different than worrying about it. But, uh, and I was, so that gave me a little while of like super powered excitement. And that's big excitement, because I get very excited about stuff when I get excited. You wouldn't know at the time to me. I get very passionate about it. Very excitable guy. Yeah. So, how would you say that the uh, workplace at Atari compares to some of the startup culture we hear about in the news today? Well, it depends on what you're hearing. So, you, know, you hear about like the venture capitalists who give like millions or billions of dollars, and they invest in this really unique office space with lots of distractions. <laughs> and, yeah, that's a great story. That's a great story, but it really doesn't happen that often. What you happens is when companies start making money, they start investing in these fabulous offices and stuff like that. When venture capitalists come to give you money to fund your thing, what they say is, we want to give you the absolute minimum amount of money, and we're going to take most of your company. So you're working for us now. Have fun. You know, so that's more like a typical venture capital thing. So you know, the idea is people in a small incubator environment you know, yeah, they're going to make their own fun, their own entertainment. They're, it's going to be a wild environment. When it becomes to the point of having to hire an interior decorator and actually build out a space and do stuff like that to, to facilitate that kind of fun, that's not a first round startup money kind of a situation. There are much more important things usually people are trying to spend their money on. But it makes for good entertainment. Mm -hmm. If you watch like Silicon Valley or stuff like that, you'll see things like that. But I don't know that that's a, a realistic picture of the thing. Mostly what you see is people who wish they had a space like that, running around trying to find someone who will give them money, and going, oh man, how are we going to do this? 
that's the more typical startup experience. So how does like the show Silicon Valley and how they portray it compare to how Atari was run? I've only seen like one episode of Silicon Valley or two. My feeling, you know, I understand it's a great show. When you've been a part of something, it's hard to watch it portrayed. It's very hard to sit there and watch people. How many of you have ever been a part of a story that got some real news coverage? I mean, we're actually first-hand participants in it, right? How accurate was the news coverage of the event? It's like not very realistic, right? Usually because reality still stands as reality, right? Anything you see, whether it's news or movies or anything like that, is entertainment. You know, so there's a, there are standards for accuracy. Like, in, you ever see in the movies where they go, "This is uh, this is based on actual events." That means it has to be like 60, 70 percent accurate. If it says based on events, based on true events, that means there probably was a person at some point, you know, who might have been a man or a woman, and they did something. You know, it's like there's there's very little because producers have an idea of what their audience wants. Right? And so what they do is they take a story and they buy the rights to it as cheaply as possible because that story had news coverage. And that's what they call pre-sold market. Okay? And then they say, now that we've got the pre-sold market, nobody knows the story anyway, but I know the story that's really going to work. And then they do their story. But the story doesn't always work because you have to remember the first rule of Hollywood is that nobody knows anything. <laughs> but they're not interested in just telling the story as it is because that's not going to be good enough. You know, when is the truth stranger than fiction? Yeah, when it's profitable. Hey, all right. Uh, <laughs> um, one of my jobs is uh, dealing with uh, simulation and everything, uh, and then have, getting people who have been through simulation, bringing them into the real world, and actually experiencing what they had just simulated. Um, sometimes I run into some really interesting things where after they've been completely trained, they get into the seat with me, and they're like, wow, this is nothing like, I, I wasn't mentally prepared for this reality. Uh, on a psychological basis, what would make my job easier? Trying to bring somebody who's experienced, but is kind of wrapping, trying to wrap their head around what's actually in front of them. You mean getting them to buy into the simulation? Well, not just buy into They've already bought into the simulation. It's just when they finally make that transition to the actual real world situation, they, they kind of freeze up and just kind of fall apart. It's like, how, how do I... Oh, well... It's tough. What you're talking about is the difference between theory and reality, right? I know a very funny joke about the difference between theory and reality that I'm not going to tell because there are youngsters in the crowd. <laughs> but if you ask me later, okay. I'll tell you. But here's the thing is that no amount of simulation substitutes for reality, and people know that. How many of you have ever put on scuba gear and tried to go underwater? Have you ever done that? So, like, the first time I did that, what I found was that I, went, I got the idea of it, and you could simulate it, you could play with it, and when we were above ground, I would put in the, uh, the regulator and I'd breathe through it. Oh, this is no problem. This is fine. When I actually got underwater, I couldn't breathe. Okay? It's, I learned it eventually. I couldn't quite do it. But because the difference is, when I'm really immersed in water, there's something in my body that says, don't try to breathe, Howard. <laughs> That's not going to work for you right now. And so you're fighting, there's a dissonance there, right? You're fighting something that ordinarily uh, you know it doesn't work, but you create a situation where it does. And a lot of times simulation does that. Simulation allows you to let a lot of things that ordinarily don't work, work. You can fly without risk, you know, in a simulator, okay? And that's a great one. And you can have a total emergency, a total meltdown, and you know exactly what to do because you know after the total crash and everyone is dead, you get to go out for tacos, right? There's no problem. So you're never going to really bridge the difference between when someone knows it's a simulation and when someone knows it's a reality. The easiest way to do it, if you really want to achieve that, is when you introduce them to the real situation, tell them it's a simulator. But don't get someone who got in the habit of crashing the plane in the simulator because it's fun. That, that would be the downside of that one. But if you can convince, you know, that would be the, the psychological way to get someone to make the transition. It's like, you know, when you take training wheels off a bike and tell the kid, I'm not going to take them off, I'm not going to take them off. And you go, okay, go ahead. Oh, by the way, you know, you don't have the training wheels on. Ah! <laughs> you know, it's that routine. That's the only thing I think that would smooth that kind of thing. Because when you get to the reality barrier, you, you can't simulate. Right. Thank you. So uh, I was thinking of uh, what you said about authorship and uh, a game being made by one auteur back in the Atari days. Um, 
are you and you know other Atari programmers critical of uh, middleware programs like Unity or licensed engines or anything that basically expedites the development process away from hard coding? I would never <laughs> criticize anything ever. I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> but the, I'm not particularly critical at it, but there's a panel at 3 o'clock, which is going to be the Atari programmers, which is the people sitting right over there, those four people next to Rob, and Todd will be there at 7. These are people who are really engaged with that kind of stuff, and they are hyper-critical people. So you will really enjoy hearing their opinion. I think that that's a question that would be best aimed at them, to tell you the truth, because I really don't have much of an opinion about it. I also don't have much time left on getting the opinion. Is that fair to say? Running out of time? Take a few more questions. There's somebody I haven't called over here. Oh, okay, yeah, the cameraman, because he's trying to show my best side, and I really I want to honor that. <laughs> because it hasn't been touched on much today, I, um, you have it stipulated in your will that upon your death, uh, as far away as we hope it should be, it will be buried in a desert. <laughs> 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 Thank you. That's very good. That's an excellent question. Actually, what it says is if, you know, people ask you all the time, what's your, what's your epitaph? What do you want written on your headstone? And the thing I most want written on my headstone is, he's not here yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have it. But having this stuff buried is great because I have to say, I am truly honored to be a programmer who has, I have one game in the Museum of, Nat in, in the Museum of Modern Art. Right? And I have another game that's the subflooring of the New Mexico desert. And so that's range. I always value range. I think that's good. Uh, what is the worst game you've ever played? You know, that's such an impolitic question to ask. I think I'm going to answer it. And so the worst, I think the worst game I've ever played was Charlie's Angels on the Game. That was, that was an unbelievably bad game. I played that game for a while. I couldn't get anywhere. I don't know that there was anywhere to go to. I, it, was, it was one of the few games I've ever played that I honestly think was released before it was cleared from development. I think people from marketing jumped in, grabbed the latest version of the code, and, and, and published it. And because it was just, it was unplayable. It was unbelievable. And the graphics weren't even that exciting. Uh, oh, there's a gentleman right here. Thank you. Um, so going back to one of the things you said, having like a, a spark of uh, a, a new sort of design innovation, I think one of the interesting things about you and your, your fellow colleagues at Atari was, was you worked at a time when uh, technology was nowhere near what it is now. And in retrospect, um, were there any sort of design sparks that you had for any particular game that you worked on or a game that you were thinking of working on that at that time the technology did not um, support being able to, to see that vision? There were, there were a couple of things I actually had this point about. And it's true. I mean, if you think about it, when we were, we were doing games in like 4K, 2K and 4K, that was the total space. Most data structures for individual elements are bigger than the entire game was now. Now it's not unusual to see a game that's like four gig on a disk, right? You know, and so if you think about it, games have actually gotten a million times larger than they used to be. I don't know they're a million times better. But <laughs> there was always the thinking beyond. I mean, E.T. was an example of a game where I think I was trying to think beyond what the technology was because I was so full of myself, right, that I thought, I'm going to do a game with emotional tone. E.T. is an emo you know, Raiders is an easy game to do a movie, I mean, it's an easy movie, rather, to do a game from because there's a natural through line of action, and that's cool, and you do that. E.T. doesn't really have that. E.T. is an emotional tone movie, and I knew that, and so what I said was, oh, I'm going to do a game with emotional tone because I want to have characters and stuff, and I want to have people really to associate with something which on the 2600 is stupid. I mean, it's just it's a ridiculous thing to think. But I was in a totally ridiculous place, right? And there were concepts. We had a break. Shortly after I got to Atari, we had a brainstorming session that I got to go to. I thought, oh, great, we're going to be able to give ideas. And there were, there were two ideas that I tried to put out there. One was I wanted to do something with uh, character development, where you set the characteristics, you set personality. Now, this was in 1981. I want to do a thing where you have characters that run around the screen, you set their personality traits, you watch them interact, and you'll just see some sort of a dynamic scene play out before you. That was an idea that was so far ahead of its time, nobody's bothered to do it even now, which is probably a good idea. But it's, 
I thought that was a really cool idea, but it was way beyond the capability. There was one idea I had at that storm that act at that brainstorming that actually was within Atari's capability, but they didn't want to go for it. Because Atari at the time had uh, they had the greatest uh, holograph holography lab probably in the world. They had been invested so much money in it, and they had amazing holographic capability, but they didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't think of a product for it. And I had a great product idea for it. Because you know they could make these holograms on these mylar sheets and stuff like that. And if you lit them from the right angle, it'd be great. And what I told them, what, we, what, what I really wanted to do with it was I wanted to make a shower naked with the stars. You know, and you could have a full life hologram of your favorite movie star naked in the shower with you. And I just thought, that would be great. And for some reason, Atari didn't want to <laughs> pursue that idea. So I really thought that had potential. You got to use the technology of the time. But I think almost everybody who worked on the VCS had a much grander vision of what a game could be than what we could realize on the VCS. But you know, people who only thought of exactly what you could do on the VCS made relatively mediocre games. You needed to be thinking beyond the hardware to motivate yourself to push the hardware. Because if you look at the early VCS games, the very early first releases, and you look at some of the later games on the VCS, even the people who were working on the VCS could not really believe the course of the evolution that it took and how far you could go with that machine. And that machine had such limited capability, it makes you ask the question, with the machines that are available today, what is it we could be doing that we're not doing it with those machines? That's exciting to me. It's an interesting question. I can probably take like two more questions. I know there's a lot of debate about this, but do you personally think that ET was really a bad game? <laughs> What a great question. This might, this might take a little while. Uh, do I think, I think E.T. was short. Okay, here, the real problem with E.T., here's the problem with E.T. There's two problems with E.T., other than the three problems and then the fourth one. But the, the, the base, one way to put the basic problem with E.T. is the problem with E.T. is I realize virtually 100% of my design concept. That's the problem with E.T., okay? Because in a really good development, you start off with a design concept, and as you move through the development, you, get, you actually do better than the original design concept. So you're actually realizing less and less and less of the original design concept as you move through it. And the problem with ET was I had so little time to do it that what I did was I didn't design a game that would take six months and then try to do that in five weeks because that's suicide. And I'm not necessarily against suicide, but I wasn't into it for this project. And so. What I did was I designed a game that could be done in five weeks. And what that means is you're probably going to go with first playable. I wanted to get something that I could get to first playable that maybe had a chance to have some legs and do something that I could complete in five weeks. And so, like I say, the problem was I actually realized a very high percentage of what my design concept was. But that was my first pass, first run concept. That was first playable. What ET didn't have was the chance to go and play with it and find out what's wrong with it and mess around with it and improve it. And that, it lacked rumination time. So that's one way to look at it. And uh, I do look at it that way. So, and it's also another one of the, pro so there's a key design principle in games that I violate with ET. And if I would have realized it, I probably would have done less of it. But what I've come to realize is that in games, it's okay to frustrate, but it's not okay to disorient, okay? Games have to have frustration. A game that has no frustration has no gratification, right? Because if it's not frustrating, where are you going? You're not getting anywhere. So you have to have, games are supposed to frustrate you and you're supposed to be able to get over that and succeed. But when frustration is when I'm trying to do something and I can understand why it didn't work, okay? Disorientation is when something happened, I don't know what happened. And in ET, there's too many times where you don't know what happened. You get disoriented, which is not frustrating. And that was a mistake. And I think I made, I made a real mistake with that. So I, is ET a bad, I think ET, I'll put up ET against any other five week development on the 2016. <laughs> I'll tell you that. But, uh, but I'm never gonna tell you it's a great game. I'll leave that to other people. But uh, I think we're pretty much out of time here. So let me just say, I will be signing autographs, like I said, at the table to the left of the uh, registration booth. I'll be there in about three or four minutes. Thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Take care.